All right, everyone's here. And this is where you get to ask interesting questions. And I hope you understand what interesting means. Uh, difficult, tough questions. Politically incorrect questions, all right? To put these guys on the spot. So can we do a quick uh, round of intro in a fun way? I don't know whether I'm up for fun. What's a fun way? Introduce the person to your left. Go on then. Yeah. You, you, you better start then, Minaj. All right. Uh, this is Minaj. He once wrote JavaScript that was in the Selenium project. That was a, that was a big thing. He's done lots of documentation. He's helping organize his conference. Uh, he used to live in Sydney, but now he lives here. Uh, but I've heard he's moving back. He's on whatever the PLC is. Project Leadership Committee. Oh. I thought of like the Palestinian Liberation. <laughs> <laughs> that's PLO. That's, that's a PLO and oh. also just wrong country. That's a lot more than I expected. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Dan knows stuff left. that you didn't know about yourself. <laughs> Like surprise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, the my person notes. on my left, Simon Stewart, described as the undeniably hairy, as you can see, as he is now. <laughs> the project lead for WebDriver, and he's been um, in the show for past 10, 15 years now. It's been a long time, as he describes. 2007. 2007. Yes, as he goes. Yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you. Um, to my left is Titus Fortner, uh, the undeniably now a day older Titus. <laughs> Thank you. He is a leader of the Water Project. He is the owner of uh, one of the owners of the Ruby Bindings. He is a fantastic swing dancer, although he doesn't do it as much as he used to because, man, the scene has changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm> too. <laughs> so young kids dance. Um, yeah, so uh, to my left is uh, Diego, who is doing uh, the Docker containers. And I have not been around the community enough to know much more than that in the last year. We'll have to, th yeah, that's, and he breezed by that when I asked him about it, so. <laughs> Thank you. So to my left, we have Marcus. He's a professional cricket player, as you can see. Um, <laughs> He has been longer than what I can remember that I know that Selenium existed in the project. And he's one of the first persons I met when I started joining the conferences. One of the warmest and nicest persons that I have met around here. And uh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> I, I think that applies to Dan. Dan Cuellar, uh, the, the father of Appium. And um, someone I met in London in 2012 and uh, who has always impressed me with his ability to compress just dense number of jokes into few number of seconds. Uh, it's very impressive. So uh, that's Dan. He lives in London, but he comes from the United States. Awesome. So the next thing is we're going to open up the floor for questions. Pooja here has volunteered to help me take the mic. Uh, and we can get <laughs> Pooja should introduce herself. No, Naresh should introduce Pooja. Go ahead. You can introduce yourself. My left. <laughs> so, yeah. One of you introduced Pooja. Okay. <laughs> Pooja introduces Pooja. <laughs> yeah. So, hi, I'm Pooja, and I have been with Selenium community when I started uh, using. Yeah, started with using, and then I started liking the idea of, oh, I can automate everything. Uh, what I was testing, so I just fell in love with that. I had been a core developer earlier, but then I became a test developer, and then on I started coming to the Zilin community, uh, whereas Anand, Anand brought me to this community, and Manoj and Narish made sure that I'm staying here, and then I met Simon last year, so just it kept going, and, uh, and the Marcus as well, so yeah. He's got the bat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll add to that, that um, I met Pooja two years ago when she was in Simon's Fix a Bug, Become a Committer workshop. I remember and it well. Before the end of the first break, he said, she's the one we're going to watch out for. Okay. 
<laughs> She's the one who's going to contribute the most or something This like is that. definitely true. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to start with a round of questions, and then I'm going to pass, it, pass the mics to other people. Yeah. So this question is something I'm hoping each of you will answer, uh, you know, from your perspective. What was the aha moment for you in, in your experience working with Selenium uh, project? Like, what was the aha moment for you? Aha as in, I now understand how it works, or? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess it got a lot easier when WebDriver came along. The APIs made a lot more sense uh, than the old Selenium APIs. Uh, I don't know if that was the answer he was looking for, but I'll go with that. Well, my moment was um, very recently, day before yesterday. <laughs> it's, a <laughs> it's a very <laughs> memorable <laughs> incident. Um, don't wish to expand it. Well, yes, my war moments was uh, when I made the first commit, uh, the definition of web driver, and uh, the next war moment was um, getting the committer access to the code base. My aha moment, I think, was when I discovered that there was a server socket buried deep inside Firefox that I could use from an, ex an extension, and it was possible to remotely control Firefox from outside the process. And then I realized that we might be able to do all the browsers. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's see here. I think my aha moment was, I mean, it kind of was a progression, right? Like I found a bug in something, and I'm like, all right, well, I can do a workaround in my test, or I can, oh, hey, well, let me fix what in my company's library that, and oh, no, it, it's something wrong with water. Like, there was a problem in water. So I fixed the problem in water, but that broke something in Ruby, in the Ruby bindings in Selenium. So I actually walked a bug all the way up from my test to my company, like, fixing the company's bug showed that there was a bug in water. Fixing the bug in water showed that there was a bug in, it had to do with how, win, how you could transfer between windows in Selenium and that you couldn't query whether a window was open or not in the Ruby bindings at the time. And I'm like, hey Yari, who was the maintainer at the time, I think I found a problem, what do you think about this? He's like, yeah, write the code for it, I'll, I'll accept it. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm gonna write the code for this. And I wrote it and, uh, and he accepted it and that was my first commit and I was super excited about it. Awesome. Um, I had to think hard about that one. Um, I remember that I started with Selenium, and uh, we were using open source software the whole time, and then I had issues like setting up the grid. And when I saw the internals, and I saw <laughs> the things that you could overload, <laughs> and I knew Java, I thought, uh -huh, maybe I can like do some open source tool that can help with that, and that's how I got into it. Yeah, like contributing to open source, basically. Um, I think. I, my career has been a whole series of them, but you said first one, right? Um, I had an employee who went to GTAC in 2008 or seven? 2007. And the, he saw the steel cage knife fight and he came home and he said, um, we had just concluded or, or at least reached a milestone with our three year project of quick test professional. Anyone remember that one? QTP, right? So we wrote, we had a three-year project in QTP that was uh, just exactly a nightmare as you'd think it was. And we came back from GTAC and he prototyped a page object using WebDriver that just contained the locators, not, not any of the, the, the smarts, just the locators, the locator map of element to locator. And a uh, developer was standing behind him when he p p generated that, when he wrote it. And the developer said, we could generate that locator map for you just for free out of our front end code. And then you can write the behavior for it in a subclass. And so my aha -ha moment was when we threw away a three-year QTP effort and replaced it with WebDriver achieving feature parity test for test within about six weeks, uh, throwing away a three-year uh, th three effort. That was my aha moment. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo moment. And then for, for even after that, the front end tests continued to generate the locator map for us to maintain our tests for us. So pretty amazing. All right, one more question. What was the shittiest moment for you guys? <laughs> yeah, we start on that end this time. Marcus is good at that. Perfectly transparent. The shittiest moment for me 
is every time I realize that um, I am not actually contributing to this code. I am organizing, I'm doing non-code things, I'm doing what Simon talked about, but for me, I, I, um, I, you know, this thing is paid for my house, and I have not contributed back to it except in sort of uh, a time fashion. So it just, it's, it's, it, it wears at me, and I want to change that. Um, I think my moment was when I was checking the grid internals, and then I was thinking how to contribute, and <laughs> <laughs> I thought that uh, sh nobody else should leave this, and then I tried to open source stuff that could make uh, life easy for people and also contribute back to the tree. That was, like, facing the grid was nice. All right, so as we were transitioning to the W3C, uh, I, the way that I designed the, uh, the drivers and subclass and, and the way that I, I set things up, I was really proud of the design work that I did and how it worked. And I was running tests constantly and finding all kinds of bugs. And uh, the Microsoft team said at one point that over half of the edge bugs at one point were mine. Um, and then at the conference last year, uh, Simon and Jim were like, oh no, this is how we have to do the desired capabilities and capabilities in the same handshake package with the this and that. And I was like, the way I designed this <laughs> will totally not work with that the way it needs to. I don't want to redo everything. Hey, Alex, you want to do this? <laughs> and Alex said, yeah. So I guess that's kind of the, the shittiest and the and a relief that someone else was able to kind of pick it up when I... The moment of freedom. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I haven't done much this last year um, because of that moment, but I'm uh, going to get back into it here shortly. Uh, I don't know what my shittiest moment... I think my, my shittiest moment was realizing that I am terrible at estimating how long six months will be. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, I'm just a terrible estimator of how long things will be. I think in 2013, I said Selenium 3 would be out by Christmas. And um, it, it, it was out by Christmas, but just not Christmas 2013. And when I started the web driver stuff, I thought I'd be done in six months. Um, and clearly, I have failed that. I told my manager at Google that moving to uh, the W3C, it would, it was, we called it the Great Leap Forward because it was a five-year plan, which, it breaks, which tends to break people down into people who understand communist jokes and people <laughs> who don't. Um, it's not a very good joke, I'm afraid. I apologize sincerely. Um, but it took over six years to actually ship that. So, um, yeah, that's it. But the rest of the time, even when things have been difficult and we've been arguing with various projects and things have been exciting and there's been all the stuff going on every single time, I'm just reminded how lucky I am to be part of this project. <sighs> Mine was a bit interesting. Um, I should actually be feeling embarrassed to say that, but I can open up. Um, <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> but the first one, right? Uh, the first one, I think most of you here can, can relate uh, with my experience, right? Um, I actually chose the hard way of contributing code to the Selenium when I chose the JavaScript bindings. And without understanding anything on promises, I apparently made uh, an API, which something was missing in the JavaScript code. And Jason Labor, the man who maintains the JavaScript code, and I was uh, seeking his help, basically. And he was quite a nice guy. He used to help me on the IRC. And I made up something on the API, and I want to get his feedback. And I didn't raise a pull request. Instead, I sent the code to his Gmail, and the reply I got was amazing. And that was my shittiest <laughs> moment. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh, the lessons learned. Yeah, don't send the code on emails for reviews, and be open in learning. Awesome. All right, it's hard to pick just one. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I'll sort of say that uh, it's either uh, when I was at the Dubai airport two years ago uh, and I thought I was coming to this conference and I found out that the last three pages of my passport were no use to me and that I would have to go back to London uh, and not get to come here. So that was pretty shitty. But I think there's one shittier. Uh, and it's like maybe six months before that, I was doing the opening keynote at a conference in Berlin uh, and I brought the Tapster with me, uh, the robot. And I tried out the demo before my, my talk. My talk was at nine. 
Uh, and I tried it at like 7.30 in the morning. It worked. I didn't move it. I didn't change anything. didn't reboot my machine. Uh, and then it came time for the Tapster demo in the talk. Uh, and it's the opening keynote. Uh, so I, I should also mention that there was an enormous traffic jam and the Berlin Marathon <laughs> and like some kind of you know 10 car accident on some major road in Berlin. Uh, so what was supposed to be a keynote to 500 people had about 40 people there. Uh, but the room was still the size for 500. Uh, and to make things even worse, uh, when it came time to show the Tapster demo, uh, where it was going to send a tweet about the conference, um, I went to, to run the code, and of course Appium threw an error. Uh, and I, s I tried to debug the error like once or twice in front of everyone, and then I just moved on. But what actually had happened uh, was my Apple developer membership had rolled over at midnight Pacific time, <laughs> which is 9 a.m. Berlin, and I was using a real device, uh, which meant I needed to be able to sign uh, to, to use Appium and the Tapster with it. Uh, and so though I had tested it only 90 minutes earlier, that was but 11.30 p.m. Pacific time the day before. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I found out only two hours afterwards, after debugging it, that that's why it failed. Awesome. Now we're going to turn the floor <coughs> open for people to ask questions. Uh, these could be things that you've been waiting in the conference but didn't get answers, so this is a good time to ask. Or you might have other kinds of things that you want to ask. So it's pretty free flow. Uh, we're going to time each person if you kind of take too much time to ask questions, like how I'm taking time now, and then we'll time you out, all right? So who wants to go first? All right. Pooja, can you help me there as a gentleman? Hi, I am Vignesh. I am part of a life science uh, company, biopharmaceutical, and I will work for the uh, test automation team. <coughs> so this is not only for the leadership, this is for the entire community because uh, I have been thriving to get an answer on this in multiple forums, uh, but there have been no concrete answer on this. So since I said that it's a life science organization, uh, it's not a typical functional testing, it's a validation testing. No, it's not an oxymoron. It's a computer system validation testing where lots and lots of documentation is involved, uh, not only for the from a testing per se, but from everything. So, and coming into the testing part, uh, so they have been doing the validation testing. Um, believe me, there is so much that could be automated, but uh, we are finding it difficult because of Selenium being an open source. Uh, they have been looking out, so any tool, it's not only a testing tool, but any tool that has to be brought into this uh, computer system validation environment, it, it, it goes through a quality management process from the procurement to everything, and it has to be uh, documented, like what this tool is all about and everything. So has anyone in their experience seen an organization or been a part of that where they have used tool like Selenium and validated it? Yeah, I have. Um, I've done work with banks in the UK who are subject to Sarbanes-Oxley compliance requirements. Um, and typically, open source code is something that they start being a bit wary of. And then they realize that because the code is open and anyone can read it, and you can build the artifacts yourself, it's actually way safer than almost anything else. Um, so whenever I've run into that problem, normally it's been a conversation and suddenly people have realized like, hang on, this is a mainstream tool that is a de facto standard that is used widely um, and it gets adopted. And I've seen the same thing happen with um, the Spring library in Java um, a, 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 as, well as, as, as well as Selenium. Um, and normally there's just a sort of small bureaucratic hurdle as they do that. If, however, you need a proprietary, closed-sourced, unreviewable <laughs> version of Selenium for some reason. Um, I mean, the protocol is entirely documented very clearly on the W3C. You could waste man years writing your own um, APIs that look basically the same. Um, and then you could use one of the proprietary vendors. So you could use Safari driver, or you could use Edge driver from, from the Microsoft web driver, and then you would have proprietary tool chain, but I don't see what that buys you. That doesn't seem to be um, incredibly beneficial. And I think most organizations are reasonable when you point these things out. 
Simon, as a follow-up to that, do you believe that once Selenium 4 is released as a W3C compliant standard with all the drivers, do you think that will be an easier case to make in a case like his, from your experience? Selenium 3 already supports the W3C specification, so um, it should make no difference. Um, the fact that it is, uh, uh, the, I don't think the concern is around whether or not the protocol is proprietary or not. I think it's because there needs to be a need to point to an individual and go, if this goes wrong, it's your fault. You're, we're the ones that you're going to sue. That tends to be the thing. And there's this terrible fear. However, if your testing code somehow leads to a major security breach, it's not the testing code that got you to that point. There is something else that has gone seriously wrong, and the review would probably end up pointing to somewhere else, which is why tools like Selenium um, are allowed in. Thanks, Simon. Probably I'll reach out to you offline and talk to you about further on this. Thank you. Does anyone else, Does anyone else want to? Okay. Hello, all. Uh, I'm Vikash, uh, part of All Estate. So I have one practical situation with me which I'm facing right now. So uh, we were using the uh, Selenium test uh, with Windows 7, uh, Windows 7 platform and IE 11. And it was working fine. And recently, they believed to update the system. So they actually updated the system with Windows 10 now. And our browser throws the Windows pop-up initially, which we have to enter the user ID password, then it opens up. So uh, with Windows 10 and IE 11, there is different kind of pop-up is coming in which is not able to recognize by the Selenium as of now. So do you have any solution for the uh, pop-up which we can handle through Selenium? Earlier, we were using uh, Authenticate using uh, some username password. We, Jim I have, Evans? I used, I tried with uh, uh, robot class. It, it is working, but it's again, uh, works in the focus. But auto IT is not working. Can I just ask one clarifying question? Yep. Which is, is this like a HTTP authentication dialogue? Or is this an operating system level dialogue? Operating system level dialogue. I mean, this is a Selenium conference. Um, if we go to WinDev, no. we might be able to help. But it was being handled by Selenium uh, with uh, Windows 7 and IE. Uh, like UFT has given the solution. Is they have different add-ins uh, for UI automation like that. Which, what was this? I, I mean, this, I, don't, I think this is a debugging session now. Um, <laughs> it, well, it's not a, it's not basic authentication. It's some OS level modal that is somehow asked. Uh, I'm not understanding your uh, no, your talking okay. in OS. You know, uh, it's like you know when you open any kind of pop any kind of uh, browser with any URL. You know, sometimes you know Windows throw the pop up uh, where we need to enter. It might consider as a authentication pop up for IE browser or maybe URL for uh, pop up for the URL where you need to enter the your username password. This Their application yeah. opens up. So it was working with uh, one of the method which is Selenium provided uh, authenticate using, but it is failing now. From your description, it actually does sound like it's probably one of the authentication dialogues that you get. Yes, yes. Um, and and the basic authentication dialogue is there's Correct. there's basic authentication. It's kind of Windows authentication yeah. or yeah. NTLM. Yes. Um, there isn't anything in the web driver specification for handling that at the moment, um, and you used to be able to get away by putting like username, uh, colon, password, at, and the URL you were going to. That ability got stripped out of Internet Explorer quite a long time ago. Um, coming up at the Lyon face-to-face uh, -face session for, at TPAC, the W3C TPAC, one of the items on discussion is handling authentication dialogues like that. So there's nothing at the moment, but it's definitely a known issue. The reason why it, was in the le it wasn't in level one is because we just didn't have time to get around to it, even though we had, a, had six years. And one workaround that I have used successfully is to authenticate using a REST API, get the token, and add it to the browser via a cookie. So that may or may not work for your particular situation, but that's definitely something to, to see if you can. And actually, for anyone that's doing any kind of authentication, test your login in one place, and every time after that, if you can authenticate uh, without having to go through the browser, and then use a cookie, it will speed up your tests. Each test by 10 seconds, give or take. I'll try using the uh, test API here. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, this is a question regarding the 
drivers. Uh, I know you've mentioned that we move the drivers to the vendors themselves, right? In some cases, it's good. Like, you know, Microsoft is doing their part by updating it more frequently, and we're getting quite a few updates and things like that. But how do we kind of, like, deal with a company like Apple, you know, who doesn't update that much? And, you know, we're basically we're waiting for them. I mean, do you have any insight into that or any thoughts on that, maybe? Um, I don't know if that's entirely fair. And, and here's why. The Safari driver version is tied to the version of Safari, and that only gets updated when Safari gets updated. And Safari doesn't do a major release very often. But they do do, every two weeks, a technology preview release. And in every single technology preview release, they have moved that Safari driver forward to be more capable and, and, and more compatible. Um, they are the third br browser vendor to ship with W3C compliance enabled by default. So they are moving faster than, than Google are with Chrome. Um, and I know the people who are working on it care passionately about improving it and moving it forward and making it better. The problem isn't so much that it's, the, the problem is that Apple is, a, is an opaque company and it's hard to see this. But if you look and see the progress that they're making, they are moving forward incredibly quickly. Um, particularly since like the Safari team, as I understand it, is a fraction of the size of the, the Google Chrome team. Um, and so they've got fewer people to, to focus on moving these things forward. But they are doing a, a stellar job. And if you care about the Safari driver, right now, the tech preview is definitely the thing to be using. Thanks, Sam. Yes, Ayman. Um, uh, one basic question here. So um, in, in, the, in the starting of this conference, uh, you basically said, yeah, yeah. So in the starting of this conference, you basically said, um, you know, I mean, you showed us uh, statistics in terms of the contributors and all of that, right? So uh, what are your um, guidelines, advices, uh, you know, I mean, uh, tips and tricks, whatever it is, you know, I mean, in terms of uh, what would you basically tell people who want to start off with contributing? You know, I mean, I have I mean, seen a lot of people uh, have this question in terms of, I want to contribute, I don't know how to start, where do I start, and all of that. So anything that you guys have in mind in terms of guidelines, uh, tips and tricks? I, maybe we just go down the line. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, so I think documentation is always a good place to start. Uh, that being said, my first contribution was building sort of an alternate reality for Selenium where it controlled mobile apps. <laughs> Uh, and then once the code got converted to a programming language I was not familiar with, uh, I was less able to contribute at the level I was when it was written uh, in other languages. And so I started doing things like the graphical user interface, and I did that using Cocoa and Objective-C and other technologies I knew, and C-sharp and WinForms and that kind of thing. Uh, and then once those sort of got rewritten in JavaScript as well, uh, now I'm largely just a, a mascot or a spokesperson uh, these days. Uh, so I think there's like a number of ways to contribute. So anything from answering forum questions to writing documentation uh, to creating alternate open source projects that question the very meaning <laughs> of the open source project you're trying to contribute to. Uh. Um, yeah, as Dan mentioned, documentation is the first place, uh, which also we mentioned earlier, and seeking some help on that. Um, it would be hugely appreciated if someone can step forward on that. And more than that, yes, we need some help. Um, potentially on organizing the conferences. Um, we on the program <coughs> committee, so we do have two conferences every year. Um, and yes, we might uh, need some help there. And coming to the other part uh, where, yes, I had also had a lot of people asking on how can I contribute code. Uh, I think to me, um, if you can clone the Selenium repository and build a Selenium jar for yourself, I think you are one step closer in contributing to the code. And that experience will actually tell you uh, what Selenium is. and you'll have a lot more experience on Buck. Um, I'll give you some practical tips. The first one is open source is about scratching your own itches. That's the, the description we used to use many, many moons ago. Find a thing in Selenium that you think could be a little bit more polished, a little bit better, and then put together a pull request to fix that. The second thing is everyone is really busy 
a pull request that is 15,000 files and will take two days to review will almost certainly just be left unreviewed for a long time. So if you could make your first pull request bite size, that would be great. That would allow us to figure out um, how to respond to you in a nice way that um, you find meaningful and things like that. And it also means that it's far more likely that someone will have the time to review your diff, pull it in and merge it. And as you get more and more experienced, your diffs can become larger. And at some point, you get the commit bit. And then it doesn't matter how large, how large your diffs are. It goes straight in. Um, the third thing is we are chronically undermanned and so understaffed. Um, and so if you have a pull request that is just sitting there and no one is doing anything, please come onto the Slack channel um, or IRC if you're an old man like me. <laughs> it started with I, I realize that I'm talking to the millennials here, the kids. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, just, just uh, log into uh, ICQ and then <laughs> why talk? Um, yeah, log into the IRC channel, which is mirrored onto Slack, um, and just say, look, I've got this pull request. It would be really nice if somebody could have a look at it. It's been sitting there for a few days. I know you guys are busy. Um, I'll move it forward there. So solve your problem. Do it in a way that is reviewable, and then when no one reviews it, just give us a gentle nudge. My recommendation is to start with the tests. Run the tests, understand what Selenium does, uh, class by class. What language do you want to take a look at? I, I know that the Ruby tests, there could be more of them in different variations. And when someone comes and asks, like, what can I do? The first thing is like, all right, get the tests, run them. And then when they don't do that, and then ask what else they can do, like, if you can't run the test, if you don't understand what they're doing, how can you add a pull request? Because I'm going to ask you to write a test if you're going to make a pull request in the Ruby bindings. Understand what the tests are doing, how they're working. You'll gain a lot of knowledge about how Selenium is doing what it's doing. Um, in addition what, uh, to what was said, uh, I think similar to Manush, that uh, if you can try to do local meetups or go to lo the local meetups to share your experience and what you have learned, or if you want to learn more about Selenium. And the second thing is that in many cases, when you are running a test or where you're doing something with Selenium and you have a bug, don't, don't find a workaround and publish a post that says how to go around that. <laughs> like actually open, open a bug, an issue in the project with a reproducible case that actually anybody can run and uh, actually reproduce the problem you're having. That's the easiest way to help to improve the product and to make things better. Uh, yeah, I think in general that's it. So, and also when you open an issue, there is a template, please use a template to report the issue. Yeah, my, my contributions to this point have been mostly my time. I would definitely echo the sentiments in terms of the community involvement. My first uh, interaction with the code of Selenium was uh, deep into my relationship with it as a user. And uh, I went to the fix a bug, become a committer in Boston, and fixed a bug, wrote a unit test or two, really, really liked it, and then found that somebody else had already merged it as part of the same workshop. <laughs> and so that didn't exactly put me off of writing code, but it, that was at the point where I started following Bob Silverberg and Ashley Wilson around saying, how do I get involved with con conference organization? And that started taking up 100% of the time that I would have spent um, involving myself with Selenium. And now, I, you know, they pay for me to travel all over the world two or three times a year. So it's, uh, that's been my involvement. And that would be my advice is to chase one of us around until you want to get uh, your trips paid for a couple times a year. Oh, by the way, when you're getting started, don't beat your head against a brick wall, like trying to figure things out yourself. If you get stuck, come and talk to us. We very seldom bite. We're normally pretty friendly. Um, <laughs> you know, and we're here to help. We, we really like some help. So rather than you getting frustrated and annoyed and, ah, oh, I can't get anywhere, just ask for help. Someone will give you a hand. Hey. Um, when, when Naresh introduced the panel, he mentioned that uh, there were going to be like, you know, edgy questions and politically incorrect questions. So mine is one of those, which is, uh, have you ever encountered somebody using Selenium for like nefarious means? Maybe like <laughs> DDoSing a website or like getting bad credentials and attacking websites? Same with Appium. And uh, what would you say to such person? That's a wonderful question. Um, 
one that comes to mind is someone I worked with went to Black Hat in Las Vegas, and a Tapster robot in conjunction with Appium and the code I wrote to make the robot touch the screen uh, was using it to brute force passwords on older versions of Android phones. Um, uh, so you would steal a phone, put it under the tapster, come back in the morning, it would tell you the password. <laughs> uh, that, that one comes to mind. Uh, there's the classic example of Nike bought a tapster, and all they did was make it go up and down and attach one of those Nike plus iPod bands to it to like test that like fake running. I don't know if it's nefarious. Um, and I don't know if like North Korea or ISIS uses Appium, uh, but if they did, um, I'd, I'm not sure what I would say. Uh, I guess if it was helping them accomplish, you know, what they wanted to accomplish, I actually don't know what I, I don't. I won't comment on that. <laughs> uh, I don't know about. Yeah, I do know. Um, <laughs> people use Selenium for like scalping tickets and hitting Ticketmaster and all sorts of things like that. Um, it's why in specification you'll see it. It modifies the Navigator, the Navigator object, and says that you're under automation. Um, that also has a link to the evil bit RFC, because clearly if you're savvy enough to use Selenium for nefarious means, you're savvy enough to recompile the browser without that particular piece of functionality. Now, the thing I'm most proud about is the reference to the evil bit is in a span that is marked as not being visible. <laughs> it's one of the two jokes in the RFC in the spec. Um, I did also help both Google and Facebook develop fingerprinting so that even if the browser is, uh, you've, you've changed the navigator to, to not include WebDriver, we could detect whether the browser was under automation because most of them have a tell, which makes it really easy to figure out what, what's going on. I, I'm not sure this really helps or not, but uh, one thing that we're working on is adding a code of conduct to the project itself. And we have a, an organization that backs us up called the Software Freedom Conservancy that is full of lawyers who can go after people. That doesn't help too much with international crime rings, but I think it, it, it could serve in the, perp in, in, in the future for us to be able to at least credibly say, this is absolutely not okay, uh, as opposed to right now where, you know, I'm not sure we say that as overtly as we could. If I'm not wrong, uh, if I'm not wrong when Jason wrote uh, the first version of Selenium, he wrote it to basically fill timesheets. That's exactly what it was for. Yeah, so that was not really for testing. Uh, it was it's really to... No, he yeah. was developing the time and expenses app that ThoughtWorks were using. Uh, he wasn't filling in timesheets nefariously. <laughs> Before that, I think... I mean, timesheets are heinous anyway. <laughs> so maybe it was nefarious. I, I just don't know. Actually, um, Retail Me Not uses uh, WebDriver all the time, probably even more than we do for testing, to validate coupon codes. Put them in shopping apps. We we respect robots.txt, so we're not doing any. We we announce to the site we're definitely not doing anything nefarious. But we put stuff in shopping carts. We apply coupon codes. We make sure that the discount was taken away. We do that hundreds of thousands of times per day. So I mean, it's a fascinating use of WebDriver, but it's uh, it's not nefarious unless you don't like coupon codes. Who doesn't like coupon codes? Well, there was there there are a few people that will come to the the chat rooms and ask for help. Automating various things that we have we have turned down as assisting uh, a number of times. I think, uh, yeah, they're uh, what Gmail, um, ticket websites, ticket websites a, a bypassing that capture have, that were like, are you going to be violating the terms of service by doing this? And they're like, uh, and we're like, yeah, good luck. <laughs> bypassing captures a big one too. I love getting that question. How do I get past the CAPTCHA with Selenium? Yeah, a lot of them are legitimate questions asking how to get past that, and, and the answer is still no, don't. <laughs> well, it's, it's like the whole, the CAPTCHA can't be very good if WebDriver can answer it. That's. <laughs> There's more some questions <laughs> in the back there. All right, we go here. Yeah. So I wrote a test uh, which I would like to run the same functionality on multiple browsers. So in shell I chose on Firefox, then went with Chrome, then went with the IE browser. So what I have done is uh, I want to run the same functionality, J just I'm trying uh, for 10 iterations. So thank God uh, in 10 iterations, seven times I got the, all the positive results, the test got passed. 
However, in the last three iterations, not lost, in 10 iterations, maybe three iterations, the test got failed. And the confusion part is the test got failed at different pages for different reasons. And it got, on the other seven times, the test got passed without any issues in the same point of time. I'm in a confusion like uh, whether I went through the logs and I'm very confused like whether it's through the Selenium API or is it between the intermediary between my test code and the application because the driver is sending the commands from there or is it from my test side because is my test flaky. So I'm just thinking if I write a test which satisfies all the conditions, it should pass 10 out of 10 times, right? So why Selenium is doing it and it is failing in some iterations at different points for different reasons? I'm still confused where to debug and how to debug it. I mean, the first thing is going to be the synchronization issue. Different browsers will load different components at different times. And so W3C is going to make the driver behavior more consistent going forward. But most likely, it's an issue with ensuring that you've got the right explicit weight settings. Are you using explicit weights? Yes, I'm using it. Uh, okay. That's why maybe the other seven iterations it got passed. My confusion is why it is failing at different reasons on only some iterations. OK. It's, I mean, um, Dan showed the slide of me going all code is shit. It's because all code is shit. Um, and also, all networks are shit. And all computers are rubbish. Um, <laughs> Like, the problem is somewhere something isn't working. An end-to-end -end test, by definition, requires the entire stack to be functioning flawlessly and perfectly in order to give you consistent, reproducible results. If anything happens, if there's a dropped network connection, if you run out of ephemeral ports, if, um, you know, there's a passing, you know, interstellar particle that hits the wrong bit of memory in the computer, um, something somewhere is going to go wrong. And and all your testing infrastructure needs to be rock solid as well. So in order to debug, the thing that I tend to do, or I used to do, is um, when a test fails, capture a screenshot. Quite often, that will give you some interesting information. If you can, record a video of the test running, and only keep the videos of the failed tests. So you can then go, hang on a second, it was hanging for you know, a mega decade until it did this. And then at least you can figure out whether it's the app that failed or Selenium. At this point in time, it's almost definitely your app. It is incredibly unlikely that that pattern of failures you're describing is Selenium itself uh, failing. It's probably the app. So there's probably some database access, maybe a database connection pool ran out, or some query timed out, or it was Tuesday and so the cleaner turned off the server rack so they could plug the Hoover in to tidy the room or whatever it is, which is a genuine test failure I had. Maybe the, the Apple developer's license expired. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny... So, yeah. I mean, just debug the way you normally debug. Gather data, look at that data, and then analyze that data to figure out like what it is that, you, that has gone wrong. And it's probably a video or a screenshot will tell you a lot. Uh, already we started, uh, like, all the application was moving uh, the development through AngularJS. So maybe I didn't get the answer uh, day before yesterday. So like, uh, since we are moving through Angular JS, how we are going to have uh, Selenium to be like supporting or developing our scripts in Angular JS, or what is the next step we are going to take? Talk to the Angular team. <laughs> I mean, seriously, yeah. like Selenium is a browser automation API. We've given you an API for automating web browsers, but the libraries that you run inside your your application are not part of the browser. They're a third-party thing that we have no control over. Um, things like XJS like to like make up random things. Um, gosh knows how Angular organized its internal state. The people who know how Angular, XJS, jQuery, React organizes its internal state are the developers of those frameworks. So the correct thing to do is to ask them to document the hooks you should use for locating elements. Uh, that being said, there's a Protractor is a tool that's provided by the Angular team that will make your life a lot easier. And you will notice that if you're using an Angular app, your tests will run much more reliably, much faster if you hook in the way that the Protractor documentation tells you to. Okay. 
last and, and question. Some, and someone this, uh, this week that uh, has worked with a protractor says, please don't use protractor right now, so. <laughs> right, that's the yeah, last uh, question for the day. Okay, my question is like, uh, will Selenium ever have its own test runner? No, it won't. Selenium, Selenium won't have its own test runner because Selenium is, an, is a library that provides for browser automation. Um, there are so many test runners out there already. There's JUnit, TestNG, JUnit 5, um, uh, BDD, Cucumber, Calabash, Aspect, NUnit. NUnit. Like, does the Mocha, world need another Nightwatch. one? Probably not. The related question is, well, will it do test formatting and result formatting? Right. And the answer to that is no as well. <laughs> <laughs> because what would happen is each tool would then have its own test results in its own format, and then it would be impossible to have like a unified overview of what, what on earth is the health of this application. And ideally, what would happen is you'd run all your tests using a standard test runner. In Java world, probably JUnit, maybe TestNG, NUnit um, in, in the .NET world, um, Mocha maybe in, in the JavaScript world. Um, and then you'd have the outputs in a common format, and then you could parse them in a common format, and it, it wouldn't matter. Uh, Naresh, I have one question to ask you when sure. we're done. Yep. You. I've got one question. Are we done? Yeah, we're done. But, you, you but I have one question to ask. Um, yesterday, you may have seen me wearing a black T-shirt with white text on it. Um, Marcus, I see you're wearing a black T-shirt with white text on it. Um, do you want to talk about why you're wearing it? Uh, absolutely. I intend to wear something like this at pretty much every time I'm on the stage. Um, this is to promote um, a, a movement, also a website, called Hashtag Cause a Scene, started by Kim Creighton, who is bent on improving the state of diversity and inclusion in the tech world. Um, as Naresh pointed out, we have 26% uh, women speakers at this conference at Chicago. We're shooting for north of 40%. And this is my way of, of saying, you know, as a as a privileged white male in tech that I'm not going to stand by and, and let this continue without making some room. And this is a very small gesture on my part, but I think it's trying to be an important one. And I wanted to get more people to wear these um, shirts with simple messages. The other one says that I'm learning how to become comfortable with being uncomfortable, which is what I have to do in order to make room for these discussions about diversity and inclusion, which I truly believe in. If you want, want a small example, tiny, tiny, minuscule example of why I think this is important, learn about the development of airbags in, um, in automobiles, where they were testing them with a bunch of, you know, five foot, ten white dudes, and they were killing people who were of shorter stature than that. So if you don't think diversity and inclusion is important, that's a tiny little anecdote that could maybe open up an avalanche for you in, uh, in this discussion. So you'll see these more on this committee, I believe. I realize there is an irony that we have a stage full of men here. Um, and like, it's something that we wrestle with. We, we need to find a way of improving and making the project more inclusive and better. Um, and I would really love to see you know, a far more diverse group of people leading this project. Like if I could step down and have some you know, amazing lady or a person of color or um, somebody of a different sexual orienta orientation or something step in and fill my place, I'd be completely comfortable doing that. Um, and I'm a bit disappointed on ourselves that we only have men up here. And I'm hoping that next year when we, when we do this, and next time we're here in India, we'll have a, an even more diverse lineup of, of people sitting on the stage. Where's Pooja? Absolutely. Actually, we, we, for the first time, we actually have an Indian on the stage. No. We and do. on the PLC we, as well. We're making and some improvement. I mean, we are working really hard. The, the, uh, Manoj is not on the PLC because he's an Indian. He's on the PLC because of all the work he's done for Absolutely. the project. Um, similarly, for everyone who is on the, on the project leadership committee, um, you know, uh, even, even the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to highlight that, uh, you know, in terms of diversity, we, we are making a small improvement. We still have a very long way to go, but I was just highlighting the fact that we are uh, improved and leave people with a positive light that, yes, we can make a bigger change.
but I'm sure if anyone who is interested reaches out to anyone that is a core contributor, we'll get lots of mentoring and support. So please contact us if you're interested and we can figure out how we can do better with some kind of outreach. Also, how do I get a t-shirt? Hashtag causeascene.com. Let's spell out the word. Hashtag causeascene.com. <laughs> All right, with that, I think we want to thank the committers for being here with us for over the last three days. Uh, hopefully, you guys uh, enjoyed the conference as much as everybody else enjoyed, right? Uh, Manoj wants to say something. Uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you, um, which I apparently forgot to thank Anand Bagmar, um, if you're here. Uh, yes, uh, he's been an amazing co-chair uh, bringing up this uh, program. And yeah, come on, please. I think we can give a round of applause for him, please. Yeah, thanks, Anand, if you can give a word about the experience. And oh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's been amazing. I think it's been 2014, so four or five years I've been associated with the planning team. I've learned a lot, uh, and I think this is one small way that I can help others as well. So thank you, everyone, for letting me be here. A shout out to Thank Andrew you. Krug as well. And last but not the least, um, huge thanks to... Hang on, we yeah. just want to complete one thing, right? Uh, a lot of times we get criticized that we're seeing the same people presenting over and over again. I just wanted to highlight that uh, Anand had actually a very interesting topic, but he said, you know, I'll keep this as a backup. If there's some speaker who drops out, then I'm available. But let's not put my name as a speaker. He, you know, even though he's more than qualified to be a speaker, he, you know, he kind of backed out to just let other people come in and present. And I think like gestures like this make a huge difference to the community. Usually, it's quite unusual to see Anand being here in the conference and not speaking. It's the first time. <laughs> Yeah, so it's coming to do. And yeah, last but not the least, um, huge thanks to Narration team for putting up this amazing show. Um, <laughs> give Runa for plus please. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Naresh, for pulling off. We know we started late, and finally we're having an amazing day. We did day. it. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> That's the point. All right. Uh, I just wanted to say that Chicago is going to happen October 18th and 19th, and that we should be. If you've submitted a paper for it, we should know within the next week whether or not you've been accepted. So good luck to everyone, and I hope to see you in Chicago. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, like we said before, the slides and the videos will be out. Uh, the slides will be out hopefully in the next week. The videos will take about a month, so you should get that. Sign my cricket bat. Sign the cricket bat. <laughs> so... Uh, Marcus wants everybody to basically sign the cricket bat as a, as a memento for him to take back home. That's right. I want to wallpaper this thing. <laughs> so please come up and uh, sign. And I think uh, we do want to thank uh, the sponsors. I think they have been wonderful, very patient. It's not been the best uh, event for the sponsors from the perspective of location, but they have been very supportive. So I do want to thank Apple Tools, uh, Sauce Lab, Mobile Labs, uh, for being part of this event and supporting us. Uh, we had very last minute another sponsor, InfoScratch, which also came in uh, to support the conference without you know, actually having a booth or anything. They said, you know, we think we like what you guys are doing, so we want to support <coughs> what you're doing. So here's a small gesture. Uh, and so that's how the community is built, and we encourage. Uh, I think people have already highlighted, so if you want to be part of the program committee next year uh, or the year after, typically we'll do every alternative years. Uh, there is a call for program committee. It's an open call. Anybody can join the program committee. Uh, we actually never uh, reject anybody. We accept <laughs> everybody who comes in. Uh, and then based on your contribution, uh, basically you either stick or basically get dropped off, right? Like that's, I think, the easiest way uh, to not be judgmental to start with, but results will basically show who sticks around and who drops off. So that's the process in case if you're wondering how do I contribute to this conference? Uh, you would look out that in, in, a, uh, in maybe a year's time, we would actually announce that the conference is happening. And here's the call for program committee even before we do the call for papers. Uh, and so that's a way to kind of join in and help uh, run this conference.
Okay. So one final thing. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Thank you all for your comments. Thank you all for all the discussions. Um, thank you all very much for the warm welcome. But most of all, thank you for being part of the Selenium community. Thank you.